I want to encourage you, uh, wherever you are, just grab your notes, your app, your Bible, your journal, whatever it is. Uh, we're going to dive into our message today. We are in uh, week three of a sermon series uh, that were uh, really an important series we're talking about called Reassembly Required. And we're talking about the church and I think we're having some brave and courageous conversations about the church. We're talking about really, uh, you know, how it got started, what it is, why it matters, and what role it plays in this pivotal moment uh, in history where we find ourselves. And uh, we've been talking in this series about, you know, right now we're looking across our nation. Some of us are looking across our world and we're seeing all these institutions uh, that are undergoing uh, sweeping change, those that are writing about this, sociologists that are writing about this unique moment in our history say that uh, uh, the positive side of it is maybe these uh, institutions are going through some transformation and change. If uh, we're writing about it from a little bit more of a negative perspective, some are saying, I don't know, these institutions may be breaking and they're not going to come back in the way they ever were. So this is a conversation. And so we thought as long as that's going on in our society, why don't we talk about the church? Why don't we have a courageous conversation uh, about the church? And so that's what we're doing in this series. And that's what we're uh, doing in this space together. Uh, I think it's an important conversation. Let me tell you why. I think it's an important conversation because we have so many people at Community of Hope who have never gone to church before. Isn't that a cool thing to think about? Your church, we have a lot of people who are here. Their first experience in, with the local church is right here at Community of Hope. And so I feel the pressure not to jack this thing up, okay? <laughs> and uh, many of y'all know the old joke I like to tell in the early days of our church. We were scrapping. We were working hard. We were, we were just trying to survive week to week. And I remember I was having a uh, conversation about faith with a guy in our community and invited him to the church. He said, oh, I'm not coming to church. I said, why aren't you coming to church? He goes, I don't practice organized religion. I said, our church is perfect. We practice disorganized religion. <laughs> and we're a lot more organized now, but that's where we started. And, and the other thing that I, reason I think it's important, I think it's important for those of us who have been in the church a long time, because here's what I want you to know, what you may already know about yourself vision leaks, passion leaks, understanding leaks. And when we think about the ways that we identify ourselves, some of the principal roles we play in our world, we know that if we're gonna really do those things well, I mean, what I love about the video we just watched, we watched uh, a man that I never met till I will get into heaven, but I met his son and I met his grandson, and I know his great-grandsons, there's a legacy that's being created. And if we're, gonna, if we're gonna end well and have a legacy, we're gonna have to continue to lean into our defining roles, right? I think about that, vision leaks. If I wanna be a husband that is leaving a legacy for my kids, I gotta keep learning how to be a husband. Uh, Beth and I just celebrated 35 years as a married couple. I used to be embarrassed about sharing that. Now I'm bragging about that. And uh, I know that we have to lean into it. I was thinking about how weird that is. We celebrated 35 years as a couple uh, last week. Our younger kids, my younger daughter and her husband, they, they're in Italy right now. They've been in, in Italy for a week. They're going to, you know, and then I think about my wife on her 35th anniversary. I took her to Texas Roadhouse. We pulled up baby in the parking lot. I said, baby, the world is your oyster. You get whatever you want. They brought her drink out. I said, make it a super size that. All right, let's move on. But if I want to be the kind of father that's going to leave a legacy, I got to lean into it. If I want to be the follower of Jesus that God is calling me to be, I'm, I'm going to have to lean into it. And so what, what we're doing right now is we're having really super important conversations about the church. Uh, they're courageous. I want to push the edge a little bit with us. Is that okay? So we began our series and we just talked about what we called the mystery and uh, we, we said something like this. How is it uh, that a leader of a, a known to be or thought to be at the time, 
religious cult born in the armpit of the Roman government? How did, uh, you know, in, in whose leader was rejected by his people and then crucified ultimately as a fraud, how did that religious movement not only survive in the early centuries of the church, how did it thrive? It's a mystery. We've been saying it this way. The only way to really describe that is that it's God's idea and God's main way to fulfill his purpose to bring heaven to earth. It's a mystery. One author and pastor that I read from, Andy Stanley, says it this way. He says, um, something happened in the first century that resulted in Christianity spreading like an airborne disease. Interesting, right? Uh, when Luke was writing his gospel, remember there are four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Luke is writing his gospel. He's writing as the only Gentile to Gentiles. And Luke also wrote the book of Acts. So he wrote two books in the New Testament, Luke and Acts. And when he wrote in Acts and he talked about the early church being born, he has this incredible statement that sounds a little like what Andy Stanley is saying in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. In the second part of that, he says this, look at this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. This is how the church began. This is what I want every one of you to know. This is how the church began. This is how it started. But here's what I want you to know. This is not where we are. And so we've said, there's a problem. And the problem is particularly a problem in the West. In the West, uh, in the world, the church is not actually growing. It's receding. Uh, we are living at a time in our culture where... Um, Large numbers of people, and this is important for the message today in the West, are stepping back from their faith. And I want to look at that a little bit more closely this morning. One thing that I'll say about that that's kind of uh, interesting is that uh, we think about uh, this as a problem. And, and while this has happened, one of the things that we're learning a lot about right now is, and this is a word popular in our culture, they're calling it faith deconstruction. There's just a lot of people in the West who are deconstructing their faith. But here's what I want you to know as a pastor. Every single one of the stories uh, that I have read about faith deconstruction, either the stories that I've read uh, in books or the stories that I've even bumped to, uh, into with people I know, here's what I want you to know if you're taking notes. None of those faith deconstruction stories actually have anything to do with faith, the Christian faith. They have to do with a particular version of the Christian faith. I was reading an article recently that said over this year alone, one million young people will step back from their faith. And, and this idea of faith deconstruction is really something for us um, to look at. But uh, as I'm saying it, it doesn't have really anything to do with uh, the real version of the Christian faith. It has to do with these suspect versions, these uh, ulterior versions of the Christian faith that don't ab absolutely represent the real thing. I was reading about a theologian who was uh, deconstructing his faith because of the problem of human suffering. As if, listen to me, as if the foundation of our faith, the foundation of our faith is, uh, is a faith where once you profess it, you never suffer. But here's what I wanna tell you. That can't be our faith, right? Our God never said that. That can't be our faith because our God participated in suffering. And so I don't really understand. Do you notice it's not really the real faith? It's a subversion of the faith. I was reading a, a, about a, um, another one, and I would just call it contradictions. And um, I was reading about a worship leader who uh, deconstructed his faith because he was reading the Bible and he ran into some contradictions or some things that didn't look quite right. He read in the book of Psalms where the psalmist is writing uh, 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 about uh, the, I think it's the sun uh, uh, rotating around the earth. And, our, and, and he said, well, that's not true. We know in science, the earth rotates around the sun. So he deconstructed his faith as if the foundation of our faith is a non-contradicting book. But that's not the foundation of our faith. 
foundation of our faith um, has to do with a God who our scriptures say in an inspired, infallible way tells us everything we need to know about Jesus. So see, sometimes there's other things underneath what we think we understand. And they become false gods to us. And so this is kind of the problem. I was reading recently, maybe you've heard this story. I was reading recently about uh, the branch of service that works in counterfeit currency. Do you know what it is? What branch of service does it? It's the secret service. The secret service is the branch in our government that deals with counterfeit currency. And one of the ways they train how to understand and experience or to see counterfeit currency is not to know the counterfeit. Listen to me. It's to know the real thing. So see, this is why this is an important conversation. I want us to know, and and Trevor pointed at it last week. There's a, we talked about the mystery. And then, you know, if we could go back, we talked about the problem. And the problem is for many of us, we don't really understand the real version of the Christian faith. And this is a problem. Well, one of the things that I think that I wanted to share with you all this morning is uh, I think actually there is a remedy to that and it really involves a better understanding of how it is actually that the church, what we're doing right now is supposed to work. So I thought we would take a look at this and Paul is writing in the book of Ephesians and I want to tell you all, when I first became a follower of Jesus, um, real quickly, the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the churches in Ephesus became my favorite letter of the Apostle Paul. And as your founding and senior pastor, I want you to know today, it's still my favorite letter. And I want to tell you why in just a moment, but I want to read a passage of scripture for you. It's in Ephesians chapter four, and it begins in verse 11. And I want you to listen really carefully because we're going to distill what I think is the difference between a church that grows and a church that recedes, a church that really embraces the full model, the full redemptive potential that God has for us versus a church that settles for less and becomes this other version out of which people can deconstruct out of. So we're looking at Ephesians chapter four. We're gonna begin in verse 11. Paul is talking about unity and maturity in Christ. And then in verse 11, this is what he says. He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers... He gave them to the church to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ, look at this, may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, look, notice what he says here. Watch this. Then we will no longer be infants. Now, wouldn't that be cool? There, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Know any of that going on today? Instead, speaking the truth in love we will grow to become in every single respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Let me tell you what's, I think, super interesting about this. Paul is giving his vision of what he believes Jesus envisioned about the church. And because you and I are here this morning, I think it's only appropriate, really, that that every now and again, right, we go back and we remember the vision that Jesus gave us in the church. Every now and again, 
uh, for those of us who are new among us and we want to put our arms around them and say, come on, we're going to learn together. For those of us that have been in the church a long time, we want to say, vision leaks. I just, I need every now and again to remember why I'm here, what this is about, what I'm doing. And, and, and Paul has given it to us. And, and here's, here's, the, here's the interesting thing he says. This is why I love the book of Ephesians. He, he, he lays out, he first talks about what I would call eternity in the past. And, and, he's, and he's teaching us God's plan from the very beginning. And then he talks about the vision present. Like here we are in this moment. Now that we find ourselves here, what are we supposed to think? How are we supposed to respond? And, and then he um, talks about the vision in the future. And Paul begins to tell us that um, there's all these forces at play in the world, but there's coming a day when all of the evil will be overcome by good. That was a great spot to really say amen. So all the craziness you see every now and again. You know, right, we turn on the news and sometimes I don't know. I've told you before, I just, whenever I look at the news now, sometimes I go, Lord, in your mercy, right? Good gosh, we're on fire. And I'm just, I should be reminded there's coming a day. God will have the last word and God's word will be the last word. Amen. Praise God for that. And, and, and so if I were to take this passage of scripture and break it down, and here's what I want you to think about and I were to break it down for you and distill into its easiest cookies on the bottom shelf kind of understanding of what it is that Paul wants you and me to understand as followers of Jesus, here's exactly what I would tell you. Like, what is the, what is the distinguishable dis the difference between churches that stretch into their full redemptive potential and churches that don't step into their full redemptive potential, that settle for something less, out of which higher percentages of people uh, deconstruct out of. If I were to tell you what's the distinguishable difference, I would break it down into this very simple statement and it would look like something like this. Every, everyone has a role to play. If the church is really going to be what the church has been created to be, if we're really going to be a church that reaches its fullest redemptive potential, if there's any sense within any one of us this morning that you look at the news, you read the news, whatever news feed it is, and you look at the world and you go, the world is not working like it's supposed to work anymore. And if, if there's any part of your heart that believes that can be different. Let me just tell you the delineating, the differentiating factor is simply this. It's a church working in the world the way God intended for it to work. And because can I just tell you all something? Let me just take a guess. Because you're here on Father's Day and not eating breakfast somewhere. I think every one of us who's here, everybody who's streaming online, you're taking time to do that deep down in our hearts somewhere. That vision is pumping and we believe it. And if I were to tell you what is the differentiating factor between the church, not in the West, that's growing and the church in the West that's receding, it's this. It's this. It starts with everyone. Everyone. Uh, and I looked up the Greek of everyone. It means everyone. <laughs> it's about $100,000 and three degrees later. Everyone, everyone means everyone. I don't know if you remember something that happened in our culture. It was July uh, 8th, 2017. Uh, it, do you remember this? Yeah. So uh, out here, you can see way up here in the corner, you can see a person that has uh, fallen victim to a riptide. As a native Floridian, third generation native Floridian, can I just say as a public service announcement in the room, you swim across a riptide, everybody. 
right? We saw baptism two weeks ago. We baptized 27 people. I was so glad when I got home, 27 people came out of the water. There were moments I thought, I'll settle for 20, 21. Relax. But um, these are people caught in a riptide. And here's what's the coolest story that happened on Panama City Beach. Just out of nowhere, all these random people formed this chain to pull these people out of the water and literally save their lives. And here's what, here's what I want to tell you. These are, these are random people. S- some, the smallest number, knew this, these people out here. There are actually two, or I think there were three. And um, most people did not. But here's the thing. If any one of these random people would have stepped out of this, it would have gotten to the point, right, where this would not have worked. This is a perfect picture of what Paul is trying to communicate. He's really trying to lay down this this wonderful uh, idea where he says everyone, and what, he know, what I notice here is he, he first talks about this in the verse we read. You know, there are apostles, there are prophets, there are evangelists, there's pastors, there's teachers, and, and there's all these people, and these people are committed and called to equip people, to equip people uh, to do the work of the ministry. A couple of weeks ago, I shared another story. I wanna show you this picture. This is a picture of, Michelangelo's Pieta. And this is a beautiful picture. I think this is in the Vatican. And um, Michelangelo created this as Mary holding her crucified son. And uh, several years ago, a fanatic nationalist, I believe, came into this place with a sledgehammer and rushed this statue and started to destroy and deface it. And artisans recreated, and you have to look actually very close to see what's going on. And we, we look at this in our world. Here's what I want to connect to you uh, in this story. We look at this and we call this a masterpiece. And in the book of Ephesians earlier that we're looking at in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul writes an interesting thing. He said, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good work. This is Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. This is the very thing that Paul's talking about. Now, here's the interesting thing. The word handiwork actually means masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. Every one of you created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Um, I talk to people all the time as a pastor. Can I be candid for a moment? Some of you I've talked to. And I talk to people all the time that feel um, unqualified to serve in the mission. Uh, I talk to people all the time who feel, let me just say it, disqualified to serve in the mission. Pastor, I've got this experience, I've had this thing, I've got this circumstance, I had this moment of weakness, and, and it's almost like um, the story of the Pieta, which is the masterpiece. And the enemy tries to deface the image of God on us, but here's what the work and the power of the Holy Spirit does. He restores what's been broken. And and here's what I want to tell you. God doesn't want to just, listen to me very carefully, restore the defaced image of God by the enemy in your life. Listen to this, and it's so beautiful. He wants to make you a new creation. The relentless love of the Holy Spirit will not stop until you and I are new creations in Christ. You are not defined by your weakest, most broken moment. Praise God, right? If, if, that would, if that were true, none of us would be here. You wouldn't be listening to me. I wouldn't be here. Beth most certainly wouldn't be here. 
Just kidding. <laughs> so we understand real quickly, right, that, um, you know, um, everyone, and, then, and then, it, then Paul says this, everyone has a role. I was thinking about this kind of funny. Uh, we're gonna, I'm just this public service announcement for all the guys in the room. We're going to get to July. It's right around the corner. And you know what July is? It's Hallmark's Christmas in July. Let's just have a moment of prayer. I just want to, I want everybody to know that's coming. This is my public service announcement. It's coming. Um, but I don't know what Christmas songs you like. Shout out your favorite Christmas song. One, one shout out. Y'all are awesome. Okay. Um, can, I, can I tell you mine? It was, um, listen to this. I did a little work on this. It, my, one of my favorite songs is Sleigh Ride. How many of y'all like Sleigh Ride? Uh, written in, in 1947. Uh, and, and the guy who wrote this, uh, Leroy Anderson, wrote it during a heat wave in July. <laughs> True story. But um, the song, the Boston Pops version of this song is two minutes and 50 seconds long. It's just two minutes and 50 seconds of greatness. But there's a part in the middle. Remember that song? Dun, 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 and there's this moment where there's this whip, this clap. It doesn't happen till a minute and six seconds into the song. And I know that I timed it earlier this week. <laughs> it, happens at, it, it happens at one minute and six seconds, and then it happens again at two minutes and nine seconds. But let me tell you, the greatest moment of the song is the and if that song didn't have to do it with me, I wouldn't be talking about that song right now. It wouldn't be one of my favorite songs. When Haley was in high school and she played flute and then piccolo, uh, she played that song and her best friend at high school at the time was that person. And I'll never forget it. She just stood there till a minute and six seconds and you know, and we all thought she was great. You're awesome. You're going to be famous. You know, everybody has a role to play. Everybody has a role to play. Um, show the next picture. Is there a picture? Familiar scene? You want me to tell you something? This is not the church. This is not the church. And can I tell you the distinguishing characteristic between a church impacting its culture and a church that's receding and becoming irrelevant? It's getting more people out of here down into here. In the West, we've tried to define it, and we've tried to look at this problem. We have a thing now that we use in the West to describe it. We'll call it the 80% rule. Maybe you've heard of it. That in most organizations, 20% of the people do 80% of the work in the mission. Can I be bold? The church won't work that way. And one of the things I want to tell you about reassembly required is um, we're going to have to come up with a different strategy. And that means many of us in the room and many of us online, we got to get out of a row and we got to get on a playing field. I want to close with a quick story. Many of y'all know who are my friends or you've been in the church a long time. Father's Day is always a little wistful for me. 2008, my dad went to eternity on Father's Day weekend. And in fact, I have a memory of uh, my, uh, with my brother leaving, uh, bringing my dad uh, out of a hospital uh, in Jacksonville, following a medical transport truck in his new car while he brought my father home to die. First two years after my dad died, I outlawed Father's Day in my home. 
no joke, until my precious wife took me aside and said, hey, bozo. <laughs> she didn't say that, but I, I felt it. She said, you, I get about your dad, but you're a dad. Got to move on. Yeah. And uh, let me tell you vision. Uh, my dad, when we moved over in 1978, my dad always, my mom and dad always went to church. So I'm not saying no judgment here. But something happened in 1978, 79, and 80 that transformed their faith. They got connected to a church that didn't do the 80% rule. And listen to me, listen to me. My dad plugged in. And my dad began to serve the local church. He began to learn that, you know what, I don't need to be called to ministry. I can take my gifts, I can take my graces, and I can serve in the mission. And it transformed my father. In fact, I, I, one of the greatest memories I have that I'll still talk to people on our East Campus, they'll say this, I served with your dad when we X. I served with your dad when, in a couple weeks before my dad passed away, and I didn't know he was gonna pass away, he came to church. It was the last time he ever came. We were in the high school. Dion was probably there. And um, I was coming up at the end of the service to close the service out, and I looked back, and I saw my father next to my mom. He was sick. We were singing a worship song, and I saw my dad like this. <laughs> and it was just, it was like it was a gift he gave me. My heavenly father gave me a gift that I could see my earthly father loving Jesus. And if I were to tell you how that changed, he got out of the bleachers and he got onto the playing field. If you want your faith to mean anything to you, I want you to see that Paul connects maturity to service. Maturity is connected to service. So if I were to be really bold, this is what I would say, and notice how I'm gonna now say it. I would say, don't say you wanna be mature in your faith, but you don't serve the mission because it's not true. That's what I would say. Come on, y'all, I just said it. <laughs> Lord, I pray that you would help us, that you would empower us by the work and the power of your Holy Spirit to be your sons and daughters serving your mission for your kingdom. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. Everyone said, amen. Keith, are we singing or not? We're not singing. Let's stand. <laughs> See, and you, all this time you thought I was in charge. You didn't know Keith's in charge. Okay? Please don't forget what I'm saying. Let's envision a church that is serving the mission in our community, that's impacting lives and changing culture. I wanna remind you, if you want prayer, we have folks here to pray for you. I want you to go in God's grace, and we'll see you next weekend.